We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I know you know this, so this is not going to come as a surprise to you, and, and you might even agree with me. Um, words mean things. When we use words, I just saw Steve's eyebrows go up, so I, I know you know that. So words mean things. When we say something, when God says something, there is a meaning to it. And we have to be cautious. We have to be cautious not to take a word or family of words and apply our own meanings to them. What matters is what God says. So when we come from the Bible, when we take a text, and when we drill down on a word or a couple of words, it is of utmost importance that we're clear about how that word is being used, what the intention of the author was, because that intention comes from God. So what I'd like to address in the next couple of weeks before we jump back into Romans is a couple of words where we have a tendency to bring presuppositions to their meaning. Presuppositions, meaning you and I have some understanding, we have some life experience, we, we have some ideas in mind, and we tend to bring those to certain words. We hear certain words, and my life experience, your life experience, what we've learned, what we've been taught, what we've read, all these things, we bring them into those words, and we say, that's what that word means. And a lot of times this is a cause for division in the church. This, this creates a split where one part of the church says that word means this. And the other part of the word church says, no, 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 that word means that. So today we're going to carefully examine uh, one of these two words here. And they're so important because they carry a lot of freight. That is, these are words on which entire Doctrines have been built. These are words that can turn the direction of a text in one direction or in the other direction. So rather than me telling you what I think they mean, we're going to hear what God's word tells us that they mean. And hopefully then avoid any dispute, avoid any uh, disagreement about things. So now why are we doing this before jumping back into Romans? I know you were just chomping at the bit to jump into Romans chapter 9, but we need to define a couple of words really carefully because they are central to understanding the message that Paul has in Romans 9 through 11. What we will find when we turn the page to Romans 9 is that Paul takes the wheel and he yanks it sharply to the right. And if you're not prepared for it, you know, your neck's going to hurt, right? He's going to completely shift his topic and his subject. So far, what has he explained? He's explained our human condition, that we are touched by sin, touched by sin so deeply that we are powerless to get out of that sin. And so he said, we're all guilty before God. Every person, Gentile, Jew, everybody is guilty before God. He says, oh, but wait, God has provided a savior. God has provided a savior in Jesus Christ who reconciled us to God, who removed all enmity by, by his work on the cross, removed it all. So we are reconciled to God. Remember, while we were still his enemies, what? Christ died, and we had our sins atoned for. So our sin problem is erased. That sounds great, right? That's awesome. But how do we become a part of that blessing? How does that become ours? It becomes ours through faith, right? Through belief in Christ. So he's laid all this out. And then for a couple of chapters there, remember, he takes on doubters. He takes on anticipated questions to this great gospel message that he's giving. What about this? What about this? What about this? And Paul wiped it all away when he got all the way to the end of chapter 8. He says, nothing, nothing, not one single thing has the power to come between you and God. Nothing in this world, nothing out of this world can come between you and the blessing of God that is yours. 
witness. So that's, that's a, a summary, a two-minute summary of chapters 1 through 8, right? So there we land. We're blessed. We're forgiven. We're reconciled to God. All these great things. But there's one burning question. One burning question that, that causes Paul to cry. This, this one burning question that caused Jesus to look over Israel and weep. And that is, what about Israel? Well, what about Israel? Because it seems, from all appearances, that God has changed his mind about Israel. Suddenly, all the Gentiles are being saved. The Gentiles are being grafted into the vine. What about Israel? What about Israel? Have they lost their blessing? Has God turned his back on them because of their continual sin? What about Israel? Well, that's the question that Paul is going to answer in the next three chapters. Chapters 9 through 11 are all about Israel and what God is doing, what he has done with Israel and what that means in the context of this great gospel message that Paul has given in the first eight chapters. He's anticipating that this question is going to come. Somebody's going to read all the way up to chapter 8. They're going to pause to take a breath, and somebody's going to go, what about Israel? Somebody's going to be tempted to say, no, that can't possibly be true, because the chosen people of God, the elect of God, is Israel. It says so back here in the shiny part of the Bible. It's clear right there. Israel is the elect. And so Paul's going to jump in and he's going to very carefully lay out what God reveals to him about Israel. And it's all good news. It's all good news. But we have to be very careful in locating ourselves in this passage. You see, that's our natural tendency. Paul's been talking about you for eight chapters. So clearly, when we turn the page and go to chapter 9, he must still be talking about me. Right? And if we read it that way, we miss the message. If we read it that way, suddenly we start reading into words. Bless you. We start bringing our things that we've come to understand in the first eight chapters, and we start reading into those words. And if we do that, We run the danger of misinterpreting the whole message of what God is saying through Paul. So two words we're going to look at over the next couple weeks. This week, we're going to look at the word predestined. Predestined, the word we'll look at next week is election. So two words that carry enormous theological freight, enormous meaning, and they are so susceptible to bringing philosophy from outside, landing it on those two words and going, that's what those two words mean. No argument, no dispute, can't possibly be any other way. Now here's what I'm not going to do today. I'm not going to bring any, any outside philosophy to bear. I'm not going to bring my theological understanding. I'm not going to bring what I believe these words mean. What we're going to do, this is, you're excited, I can tell. We're going to see what God says about those words, in particular about predestination. And we're going to do that because that's what should be central. That should be our first step in understanding anything that God says. If we have a word like predestined that carries such enormous weight, the first thing we should do is look and see how it's been used elsewhere in the Bible. Doesn't that make sense? Right? Let's go see how that word is used. And particularly, okay, how this same author uses that word. Because it's very rare that an author uses a word like predestined to mean this over here, but I meant that over there. 
we all speak English, so we know there are a lot of words that can be used that way. Predestined is not one of them. Okay, so we're going to see what God says, and in particular, we're going to look at what Paul uses the word to mean. In the New Testament, there are, you're thinking probably, what, a hundred, hundred and a half instances of predestination? Okay, you were close. There are six, six times in the, what, million words of the New Testament, six times this word appears. Pro horizo, pro horizo, pro is a prefix, it means pre, it means before, okay? So it means before, so God does something before, right? So that's pro horizo, that's the word we're looking for. There's a usage in Acts, and Dr. Luke is too smart for us, so we're not going to look at that one there. And then there's a usage in Revelation, and John's got a whole other thing going over there. So we're going to simply look at three passages where Paul uses that word. And we're going to see if there's a consistency from which we can derive the meaning in those words. So... You got a little pencil, you got your Bible. Now we're going to be skipping around here, okay? So don't fall asleep. Don't, there's no napping this morning here. So the first place we're going to go is Romans 8. That's where we're going to start today. So a quick grammar lesson, a complete sentence. What's it made up of? Oh, my word. Okay, so this thing called a subject, okay, and a verb, right? So, predestined by itself is not a complete sentence. Somebody has to predestine. Here's how easy this is, all right? In every usage, including the ones we're not going to look at here, in every usage, God, God, say it, God is the subject of that sentence. God prohorizo, okay? God predestined. That means in every instance of this word, God has taken the initiative to do something beforehand, before that current moment. Prohorizo, before, okay? So God, subject, then... Although that is a complete sentence, Paul doesn't use it that way. Paul doesn't, you know, set aside chapter 9 and go, God predestines, period. He doesn't. God predestines something. And this is, this is where the word gets off track sometimes. This is where little divisions creep in here. What is it? This is the question we're looking to answer. What is it that God predestines? What he prohorizo has to do. So we're going to go Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. Let me read them to you, and you watch and see what predestined says in here. Verse 28, and we know... That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, that's another freighted word right there. For those God foreknew, he also predestined what? What did God predestine for his people? To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Don't miss this now. And those he predestined to do what? To be conformed to the image of his son. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also and the, the form takes a different form, will glorify, okay? So this is, this is the passage that we're looking at here. So we have two of the instances of the use of the word here. And fortunately, they're all close together. They're all in the same thought unit. We know who it is that predestined. It is God who predestined. And in this case, when we ask the question, what is it that God has predestined for his people? 
to be conformed to the image of his son. We used a fancy word for that that rhymes with sanctification, right? That is what God has predestined his people to be. So now we have the first fact that we can file away here. God has predestined a certain people to be holy as he is holy. That is what God has chosen for his people. He decided beforehand. Now that's a piece of information that we're not given here. And you, I, I can see the wheels already turning here. Your presupposition cranked in there, didn't it? Your presupposition is that, oh, oh, God did this before the foundation of the world, didn't he? Right? But he didn't say that. So now you, see, now you see how presuppositions work. Because you're all Bible scholars, so you've taken that presupposition, you've brought it over to that word, not in the context. Right? That's where we have to be careful. So God has predestined His people, the people. How, he doesn't say how they become His people. Paul's not touching on that here, and he's not doing that because he's already spoken about it. He's already said, by faith, by, remember that? 116, first thing he said in the book, by faith. Okay, so he's not explaining that there. He's saying this is the process of sanctification. God is calling out a people. God is separating off for himself a people that he's going to make holy. And you're saying, but pastor, why is he making them holy? We're not given the answer to that question. We're not given the answer here, but your presupposition came, didn't it? Your presupposition shot in on the other side. Well, clearly he's making us holy because we're going to spend eternity with him. But again, we pulled that out of context. We pulled it before the foundation of the world out of context, and we pulled those things in. So we have to be careful. We work with the facts that we've been given here in this short passage. So you see all the theological, all the doctrinal freight that comes with that word. The other freighted word, of course, is foreknew. God foreknew. For those God foreknew. Now, don't read into that word. That simply means that God knew them ahead of time. Now, was it two seconds before Paul wrote these words down? Or was it before the foundation of the world? We'll, we'll have to read everything together. Now you see why we don't take one word out of one passage and build a doctrine on it. Because we had to bring a lot of answers to questions into this word. We freighted this word with a lot of things that aren't here. So in this passage, God is predestining us, pre pre. Who predestinating us. Is that a word? I don't think it is. But predestining us to be conformed, to be made holy, to be set apart, to look like his son. And why? We are given the answer for that. So that we will be one amongst a number of brothers and sisters. So that we will look like our brother Jesus Christ. Yes? All right, next passage we're going to, 1 Corinthians. Don't flip too far. It's real close. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to look at just a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, I, I learned something that I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not sure I'm fixed on it yet. That 1 Corinthians, a lot of scholars are dating this before the Gospels. They're dating this before the Gospels are given forth. And, and that means that these instructions for communion, these instructions for the table that we received, are really the first instructions for accepting the, the feast. But we're off track. We're not going there. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Let me read these. And listen, as I read this, listen to how this links to the passage that we just read. Okay, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God 
destined, there is the proharizo there, God destined for our glory before time began. So now we get a little piece of this now. Okay, now we know how far back God planned this stuff. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, underline that, circle it, do it in pink, whatever highlighter you've got in your purse there. Okay, highlight that and always link that back to what Paul had just finished saying at the end of chapter 8. Those two are inextricable there, and it's so important. And why? Why? Because it begins to direct our attention to what chapters 9 through 11 are going to talk about. What of Israel? What is God doing with Israel? Well, Paul is pointing out right here that some have been blinded for a purpose. Had they not been blinded, had they not been eyeballs covered, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And had they not crucified the Lord of glory, no atonement. Okay, so keep that in mind. Link those two always together. All right, so Paul has given this little little preemptive remark up in verse 2 up there, right? I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So we read this in the context of Him speaking about Christ about the knowledge of Christ, about how we are blessed to have our eyes open and our ears open so that we can understand all of this. So with that foundation, he gives that statement. And he's basically saying that in, in the context of Christ, in the context of salvation, that God has allowed some to see, some not to see, but for a purpose. Not just randomly, not like God sat down and made up two lists and said, these people are going to see, these people are not going to see. No, he's called them, dare I say, he has elected a group of people for his, we're going to talk about election next week, okay, but God has chosen a group of people for a specific purpose and that group, he has blinded, he has darkened their eyes, right? And he tells you why. Had he not darkened their eyes, had he not, you know, solidified the hardness of their heart, they never would have crucified the Messiah. Okay, so, Predestination back here, okay? We declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. So, believers and unbelievers see things differently. Believers, God has predestined for believers, those who will put their faith in Christ, He has predestined for them to be conformed to the image of His Son, for them to understand the mystery of His revelation, for them to be awakened, for the Holy Spirit to be given to them so that they can apply the words that they're reading. To unbelievers, now notice... Nowhere in here does it say he's chosen unbelievers for destruction, right? It doesn't say that. It says he's chosen believers for this purpose, and he's chosen to harden, harden those who didn't believe in Christ for a purpose. So... We've got some facts now about predestination. What has God predestined? For his people, this this holy group of people, for them to be conformed to the image of his son, for them to have the likeness of Christ, for them to have the character of Jesus, for them to be holy. And how is he going to go about doing that? By giving them ears to hear and eyes to see. For them to be able to see and separate themselves from the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God's word. Okay, so that's three usages. One more. Ephesians chapter 1. Again, don't flip too hard or you'll go right past it. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this is the the last of the Pauline passages. So, so far, we've only read Paul's usage of predestined, of proharizo. 
If you ever look up the other two, they're going to come up the same, but we're going to concentrate on Paul just to make this simple. Wait, is this too simple today? Am I being... Okay, it's just right. I feel like the mama bear. Is it the mama bear that was just... No. Anyway. All right, so Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now, you've heard this dozens of times, but I love reading it, so I'm going to read it to you again. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in whom? In Christ. Don't miss that. Never miss that. For he chose us. How? How did he choose us? In him. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. What did he choose us in Christ to do? Be holy and blameless. Be conformed. Understand what the word is saying to them. Look, don't miss any of this. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. How awesome is that? He predestined us for adoption. That is to be brothers and sisters to his son. Brothers and sisters to Christ. And how do we do that? By belief and by taking on this ever-growing image of the Savior. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Now, if I gave you a quiz right now, a pop quiz, here it is, pop quiz, one question for all the donuts here. In whom is everything vested? Jesus, right? In him, in him, in him, over and over and over. So many times, so many times when we're having deep doctrinal, theological, um, not arguments, we don't argue, discussions, discussions about this passage, there's an emphasis that gets left off of it. There's even sometimes words that get left off of it as people read this. I mean, let me give you an example, right? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everybody's good up to that point. For he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to adoption, to sonship. You see the words that are getting dropped off there. The emphasis that gets dropped off is in him, in Christ, through Christ, through Jesus. Jesus. But you can't do that. Paul put those words in there for a purpose. Paul gave those words in there to fully explain what he means by predestined. God did not sit down and randomly choose a bunch of people. He chose us in him, in Jesus. He chose us in Jesus. And that is so crucial. Now you see the thread that winds through these passages here. We were chosen in Christ. It is Christ who atoned for all of our sin. Agreed? Without Jesus, nothing else works. It is Christ who gave everything to atone for our sins. It is Christ who removed the enmity between us and God, who reconciled us to God. It is in Jesus that God has chosen to bless the world. It is Jesus who fulfills that Abrahamic promise that all the nations would be blessed through Israel. They are in Jesus, through Jesus, through faith in Christ, through belief in Jesus Christ, everyone. Everyone, everywhere, in all time, can be blessed. That's, that's what's central to this passage and to understanding this. You have been predestined to be adopted into the family. 
not because you're extra special, which you all are. You're all extra special to me. But God looks the world over, history over, time over, and he's building from amongst all people, from all time, a family. A family. And he's made one simple condition to that. That family will be composed of those who have faith. Those who have faith. Oh, but what of Israel? Well, listen, everything in Israel is of faith. I just mentioned Abe just a second ago. God didn't come down and say, Abe, I need you to move, and then boot him along, did he? No, Abraham had to make the split-second decision. Am I going to believe this? Am I going to do that? Yes. And he chose correctly. He did that. Right? Moses stands up before all Israel. And he says, ba 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 that's, that's what Deuteronomy sounds like. ba 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 He gives the whole great sermon in Deuteronomy. He lays it all out. And then what does he say? I think he paused for effect. <sighs> Took a deep breath. And he said, I've laid before you life and death. I don't think he shrugged his shoulders, but I, I think he said, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. Right? And then God sends him into the land. Well, not Moses, but sends the rest of them into the land. They cross the river. They fight, fight, fight. They get the land. And at the end of it, eh, there's a little whining, but there they are. They're secure in the land. And then Joshua stands up. Just like that, he paused for effect. Joshua stands up. And he looks over all gathered Israel. And he says, choose this day who you're going to follow. I think he grabbed his lapels and he said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So we've seen choice, faith, choice, faith, choice, faith throughout. God has always operated by faith. And then when Christ atones for sin, the condition becomes, the new covenant becomes faith in Christ, faith in what God has done, faith in how God has redeemed all people, not just his select people, all people. And now you see what he's predestined. God is building for himself a people with whom he will spend all eternity, with whom he will, he will bless everything on them. And that's what he's doing. He's saying while you're here in this world, you are predestined to be conformed to the likeness of my son. You will grow in your holiness. You will grow in your sanctification. You will do that and then one day... We will spend all of eternity together. If you run your finger real quick over to verse 11. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were, oh, oh look at this. In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ to have faith, might be for the praise of his glory. We are predestined to be people of praise. We are predestined to be people of mercy, of knowing what it means to be forgiven, of knowing what it means to be reconciled to God, of knowing and then showing. I thought this was really splendid, the way Mike has been just leading up these stairs. This builds on this, builds on this, builds on this. This is the summary of it. This is what you will look like as members of the kingdom, as God's people, as you are conformed, as you are sanctified, as you become holier and holier. You will realize the depth to which you've been forgiven, and you will never again be unforgiving. You will not ever hold a grudge. You will not ever look out and say, no, I, I refuse to forgive that person. I'll forgive Rick, but nobody else. Ne never, ever, ever, ever would you say that because, because you've come to this full knowledge of what it means for God to forgive you. And I know you're all saints. I know that. 
Wink. I know, we're all saints here, right? There's nothing in our past that we might even be close to ashamed of. But we know what it means to be forgiven. And we are transformed little by little by little. So what is God predestined for us? To be changed, to be radically changed, to be more like Jesus, to look more like the family that he's building. God decided beforehand what he will do. God decided beforehand, pro horizo, how he would do it. God decided beforehand, before the foundation of the world, how he was going to work everything in history out. God did all that. All of it was decided. All of it was decided before the foundation of the world. God knew how he was going to work everything out. And how did he do it? In Jesus, in Christ, in him. And that's how God is building for himself a holy people. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise him. And so how are you going to praise God for this? We could sing hallelujah again. Well, not hallelujah. All creatures. We could sing that again. I'm, I see a couple of votes for that over here. We can sing that again, but, but there's so many other things, right? And, and again, thank you, Mike. I'll, I'll use this old adage, right? Right, this, this old adage. Actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. And I, su- I, I suggest that now that we understand predestination, now that we have a, a little better grasp on that, I suggest that we apply ourselves to that being conformed to the image of son uh, of his son i suggest that we devote ourselves to that we devote ourselves all the rest of our days the thousands and thousands of days that we all have ahead of us right we apply ourselves to that and the way we do this is by giving ourselves over applying ourselves to the means to the means that god has given for our sanctification right number 1 we recognize the grace that's been given to us no cheap grace. We recognize the enormity of the cost of the grace that we know, right? We know that we've held the body and blood in our hands this morning. We know the cost of that. So we recognize the cost. We recognize the depth of that grace. We recognize how completely God has forgiven us. We recognize what it means to be forgiven. And as we know that grace, as we know it, you know what I'm going to say next, we show that same grace. That's how we practice that. And if we find ourselves not showing grace, what is it telling us? We need to go back and reflect on the cross. We need to go back and reflect on the fact that God predestined us to be changed that it's not an option for us to be saved and then remain in our seats all the rest of our days we are to be continually being conformed to his image right so that's it we know that grace we show that grace we do it right we see in adoption we see in the fact that God has brought us together that we are securely a part of the family that's what Paul was saying in Romans 8 ain't nothing gonna separate you Nothing is coming along, so you can be assured in that. And so, because we are forever going to be in God's family, we, we, we really have no choice but to devote ourselves to looking more like the family. I mean, it's fun to be the black sheep for a while, but at some point we have to come in and we have to find ourselves amongst our brothers and sisters. We have to build that fellowship, share that fellowship, know it. All the while, we're being conformed to his image. And Paul's given us, Paul, God has given us tons of tools, any number of things that we can use. To, I mean, we, we read the Bible not just to, to fill our domes with more knowledge. We read the Bible to hear God speak. And when he speaks, what do we do? We obey. If God says, do this, we do this. And we do this not just by ourselves, we do this together. When we read the Bible together, we can bring all of our voices, all of our lived experience together and say, I think this, I think this. And and we can nudge one another along in understanding what it is God's saying. But once we understand, we're committed to obeying it. We We don't have the ability. I've looked. 
There is no ability to hear God speak, say you must do this, and then choose not to do it. I, I can't find it. Okay, So until we find it, we must commit ourselves to doing that. And why are we doing all this? We're doing this so we can draw closer to God. Being conformed to the image of his son is not so that we get a prize. Well, I guess we do. But we don't get a special prize at the end of time because, you know, you look more like Christ than, than I do. There's nothing like this. We do this because we've known God's mercy. We've known his grace. We've known his love. We have evaluated the cost of the atonement. We've, we've taken all that into account and we realize how incredibly blessed we are. So this is not pastor saying you have to do all this stuff. It's God's word saying you should want to do this. In light of the blessing that you know, this is what you want to do. So words mean things. Predestined, proharizo means something. Now you know where to find it. Now you know what it means. And when we pick out a word, and then we'll look at another word, election, next week, those words are there for a reason. Right? The authors were inspired to use those words for a reason. And so these are important words, important concepts. When we look at predestined, when we look at these instances of pro herizo, we see that the Bible reveals to us that God decided beforehand, and now we know that it is before the foundation of the world. God decided beforehand that you and I, that everyone who will believe will join this holy set apart family of God, this eternal family. And we'll be a people of belief. We'll be a, a people of piety, of, of holiness, a people of love and mercy. We will be, all of us together, all Christians in all time, we will be this people who match in every way, in every way possible, the life and the person of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand.